All right, let's get started. Well, good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. Very, very happy to be here at the DevFest DC again. This is my second year, second time here. And uh, I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is I love to bring some of the latest and greatest technology that uh, Google has to offer to developers all over the world. On the other hand, I also like to hear about how you're using our technology today, and I want to listen and learn about your feedback and what you are doing with the technology as well. So I'd love to talk to every one of you that's here. The best way to reach out to me is via my Twitter, at Satanism. It probably has my highest interrupt. What that means is I usually don't answer my emails because <laughs> because I, I, there are just too many of them. But if you tweet me, I will definitely see it. Okay. And very briefly, uh, Google Cloud, if you want to learn more, go to cloud.google.com. At the very high level, we have everything from infrastructure as a service all the way to platforms as a service and also big data related services and very popular and very uh, uh, popular in demanding in demand today is machine learning. Right? So uh, there's a lab right now. There are a few talks. So uh, don't check it out. Try, try them out. Okay. And uh, very quickly, if you're interested in Kubernetes and containers, there's a hands-on session tomorrow at, I believe, 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. So come along with your computers. You get hands-on experience. Now, this talk is going to be more about microservices and gRPC. Uh, there's no theories. It's uh, show and tell uh, what gRPC is and what you can do with it. How many people here are thinking of developing microservices or already are using microservices today? Oh, wow, very cool. That's why you're here. All right. I uh, hope I don't disappoint. All right. <laughs> and one of the biggest uh, issues that you're going to see as you're migrating or as you're implementing microservices is that, well, first of all, it used to be that we just have a single package or a single application we need to deploy and manage and monitor. With microservices, right, one of the first problems you're going to see is now we have many, many more packages, many, many more applications, many, many more instances that we have to deploy, manage, and monitor as well. But we can solve that problem uh, with the newer technology like Kubernetes and container orchestration, uh, which you can try out tomorrow, and we can solve some of these problems today. However, one of the things that most people don't think about is how are you going to communicate between the services? And I think for the most part, uh, REST and JSON over, over HTTP has been like the default, right? Because we have gone through a lot. We have gone through quite a lot in the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years, starting with maybe Corba. I don't know if anyone done Corba before. Yeah? <laughs> All right. Awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll show you a page which I saw the other day. I'm like, how do I do Corba? Like, it's been so long since I have done it. So I found, I went to online, I went online, I Googled uh, Corba tutorial, and this is one for Java. I mean, it's a really, really nicely written uh, page. You know, with Corba, it has the concept of IDL, right, uh, interface uh, definition language, which is pretty, it's pretty important in this type of RPC services because you need a way to, to define your service in a canonical manner so that you can generate platform-specific code. So this is necessary in most of the RPC-related uh, frameworks. And then I scrolled down. I wanted to see how I can implement it. And uh, implementation is not bad. But then I wanted to code it, and then I saw this big blob of code, and I just gave up. I'm like, you know what? Forget it. That's, that's why <laughs> Corba was really hard to use. And RPC has a bad rap. RPC typically has, like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to touch you anymore, right? Um, and then there was DCOM. I don't know if anyone used DCOM before. Yeah, <laughs> a few, yeah. And then, uh, and then any Java developers here? Java? All right, go Java. I'm a Java developer myself. And we had RMI, which is really easy to use for the most part. However, it is not very interoperable, right? You're kind of stuck with the JVM, the, the Java ecosystem. Now, of course, someone else came up with a, a more interoperable idea and way of doing things, and that is SOAP, right? And anyone have done SOAP before as well? Still doing SOAP? Yeah, wow. What? <laughs> Many people put their hand down. Uh, <laughs> but it is very interoperable, right? It is interoperable. For the most part, it is interoperable, more so than RMI. But I think RPC can be great, right? A lot of people have moved away from these things because it's getting more and more complicated. It's not delivering the promise. It's not easy to use. It's not interoperable. So why RPC, though? Well, first of all, I'm a Java developer myself. I want to know whatever 
message, whatever payload I'm creating, is strongly typed. I don't want to be surprised by a missing field or being surprised by an additional field I sent accidentally. I like strongly typed systems. So I, with RPC, with IDLs, we can define that very, very easily. And RPC is typically more efficient. Most of the RPC protocols are going to be using binary protocol, which, you, which can be a lot more efficient than transferring you know, JSON payload over HTTP. Now, this is kind of funny because if you think back, people started to talk about, oh, SOAP is being too slow, right, because of the XML, because of the robustity of XML. But now, as we are breaking down these microservices for the backends, what people are discovering is any text-based protocol is going to be uh, not as efficient, and that cannot include JSON and um, REST. Another nice thing about RPC is it allows you to define operations that otherwise are not easily expressible in REST. In RESTful services, you are kind of stuck with uh, the HTTP verbs, the get, the put, the patch, the deletes, right? But not everything in business, not everything in services is a CRUD operation. What if you do need to have a transaction across multiple things that is simply not expressible by a CRUD? Hello, whoa, hello. Whoa. Hey. Friends, uh, the next sessions are starting. Oh, oh, I guess we're starting, yay. Please <laughs> start going there if you want to, okay? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, come on in, yeah. <laughs> I guess we'll keep going. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so, so for example, if you need to deduct money uh, or have transfer money from one account to another, it, it is not very expressible in REST, right? You, you don't get input um, all at the same time. You need one single operation to do both. So to me, RPC can be really great if it's simple and interpretable and easy to use. What do we do at Google? At Google, for the backends, um, we use a technology called Stubby. Stubby is a binary-based protocol that we have developed and been using for many, many years now. And it runs basically nearly all of the backend services and backend communication. We make 10 to the 10, I think that's 10 billion RPC calls per second in our data centers with Stubby today. And if you were to think that if this protocol is just to take one extra byte that's unnecessary, that is 10 billion bytes additional overhead we have to transfer in between services across our data center. So if, if it's a text-based protocol, that is, again, significantly more bandwidth that we have to handle. So Stubby is something that we're using internally, and gRPC is literally the next version or the, the open source version of Stubby. The story that came about uh, is well document, documented online, but basically uh, Google was looking to open source Stubby and or make something even better. And another company called Square, they also wanted to use a binary protocol. Uh, they were working on something. And then they, they decided, you know what, why don't we join force together and develop this new uh, protocol, which is called gRPC, this new framework that is specifically designed to be high-performant and simple-to-use RPC framework. And uh, gRPC was released, the first release, I think, just about a year ago, and now it's actually GA, it's 1.0 release, just came out like a month ago. And it's easy to use, and uh, we'll see how that works. It is based on three simple ideas. Well, the first one is IDL. You still need some kind of interface definition language. Uh, it is necessary because then we can, again, define a service in a canonical model, and then we can translate that and generate code for different platforms, whether it's Java or uh, C-sharp or whatever else. It is standard-based. What that means is the transport that gRPC uses is based on HTTP2, which, again, is a technology that was also based on uh, Google's uh, technology before, but now it's all opened up and now it's standardized and now it's known as HTTP2. And there's quite a few nice things about HTTP2. Um, I don't know if anyone have seen or used HTTP2 already. Yeah, quite a few. Uh, some of you may be using it behind the scenes, you just don't know it. If you open up Chrome and if you see the connections, some of them says, it says H2. That's actually using HTTP2 connection behind the scenes. What is so good about HTTP2 is that uh, it, it has certain new features that's really nice. Number one, it is binary-based protocol. So rather than a text-based protocol, which I, I kind of miss, because with the, with the text-based protocol, you can, TC, you can tailnet into the server, and you can say get, and then the URL with HTTP 
one protocol, whatever, like you can do this via the command line. But uh, with HTTP2, now it's binary. What that means is all of these things are gonna be encoded into bytes, but it's gonna be more efficient. A lot of the traffic that's going over HTTP connection is not just handshaking, but also the headers. I don't know if you ever, again, in Chrome, open up the, you know, the, the inspector and see that HTTP connection and just see how much traffic is in the header. It's, it's there, it's maybe, you know, not the same amount of as the content, but if it's like a restful call, the header could just be the same size as your content as well. In HTTP2, the headers can be compressed, and it's compressed by an algorithm called HPAC. What that means is, as the header comes in, uh, it's, it's going to be keeping reference of the commonly used uh, uh, keys and values, and then so within that connection, you don't have to resend the same key and value over and over again. You can encode it very efficiently. Finally, with HTTP2, you can do streaming. In HTTP1, streaming is not native. What that means is if we need to do something uh, that's almost real time, you have to deal with WebSockets, right? And with that, there, there are some issues with that. I'm not gonna get into details, but it's, it's hard to uh, make like a, a proper system where you have to handle the, the disconnects and WebSockets and streaming like everything together over the HTTP1 protocol. With HTTP2, it is default. It is natively supported and it supports bi-directional streaming, okay? Not only can you stream from the server to the client, you can also stream from the client to the server, and you can stream both way. And the connections are multiplex. What that means is, if you make multiple requests, rather than opening up multiple connections, like what we do today with, with HTTP 1, uh, with 2, they are all multiplexed over the single connection, so you don't have to deal with a lot of the connection open and close overhead either, okay? So all of these are really nice. With streaming, this is one thing that you can possibly do. Uh, for example, if you requested the index page, okay, what typically happened today is the browser requests the index page, see what's there, and then make additional requests for all of the other resources, right? And now you are kind of opening multiple connections, just waiting for things to pull. With streaming, it's possible that you make one single request to the server, say, I want the index page, and the server can proactively stream to you the other resources that you might otherwise need immediately. So your, your client doesn't have to wait to make those requests. We can stream the data to you immediately. So check out HTTP2. It's not limited to gRPC. It is open protocol for the next generation of your web application. So definitely check it out. Now finally, for the payload, for the payload that you need to uh, send across the wire to your services and for your responses, you need a way to encode it, right? Whether it's a JSON encoding or something else. In gRPC, by default, we use Proto Buffer 3. And Proto Buffer 3, again, is a binary uh, encoding uh, uh, protocol that we have, uh, algorithm. So given like, an object, it's really, it's try to compact it as, into as few bytes as possible, right? So we don't repeat the same key values over and over again, okay? Very high level comparison, this is a, uh, a chart that came from the, uh, uh, one of the announcement blocks for gRPC. You can see very clearly the, um, uh, the throughput on the binary protocol is, can be magnitudes faster than um, the text-based protocol, right? But not only that, as we are developing these microservices and uh, potentially cloud-native applications where you do want to run in the cloud, remember how cloud providers charge money for, right? What do we charge money for? We charge for cores. So what you want is to be as efficient as possible per, per core, right? So here's another study that they've done uh, where they have gRPC versus you know, JSON over HTTP with throughput per CPU core. And again, you can see that with the binary protocol with um, you know, some of these things natively compiled into your code, rather than interpreting it uh, as the data is coming through, you get better throughput and you get more requests per second as well per CPU. Very high level gRPC supports multiple languages, but I want you to pay attention to a few of them, which is Objective C, C Sharp, and Java. And these are important because these are also the languages that people use for mobile application developments, right? So not only do we support PHP, Python, Ruby, Node.js, and Go and Java on the back end, you can also use gRPC on the front end as well for your mobile applications. And this is nice because the mobile phones typically may not have as much bandwidth, right? You gotta be pretty efficient in terms of how you use users' bandwidth. And 
with the streaming and with some of the gRPC features, what you are potentially able to do is to make more responsive user interface as well, where you don't wait and block the UI until everything comes back. You can stream the results back to the device so that things can appear progressively. So let's see a few things. Uh, I'm just gonna, that's all the slides I have. So thank you very much. No, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go into the demo and, uh, and just show you how this thing works. Okay. So I, there are quite a few Java developers here, so I'm gonna be primarily writing Java to demonstrate some of the gRPC features. So the very first thing that uh, you're going to do is to be able to create a proto file. A proto file is the IDL, that is the interface definition language. Okay, and uh, with the IDL, I can define my message payload and how the service look like. So with the IDL, first thing I need to do is to make sure that the syntax is proto three, because otherwise it's going to use proto buffer two syntax by default. That's probably not something you want for gRPC. Second thing that you need to do uh, is to you can give it a package just like um, like a Java application, right? Every class can be in the package or in Many of the different languages, you have the concept of namespace or just grouping different classes together. Uh, here I can do something like com.example.grpc. That will be my package. Uh, and then there are some language or generated specific configuration you can, you can add to this, right? So for example, for Java, uh, by default, it's going to generate all of the code for you into this one single giant Java file. But that's the default generator behavior. But you can, there are certain options you can add and change the behavior. So for example, if I want to generate to multiple files, I can do that. And now when the generator sees this IDL, sees this uh, proto file, it can do things a little bit differently, okay? And then, before we can actually define a gRPC call, we need to define the payload, which is the, the request and the response, right? So for example, it, it's very easy to do. Uh, if you're accustomed to Java development, you know the concept of class. Uh, in different languages, maybe structs or just uh, a structured data. In gRPC, it is just message, okay? And I can make a message, for example, uh, message called hello request. And that's a message, that's a payload I can actually use. And within this payload, I can define multiple attributes or fields. And every field is strongly typed. So I can have a field called name, for example, and I can type it to string. Okay. Now, here's what's interesting about gRPC and protobuffer is that every field, you have to assign it a numerical tag. Okay, this number is gonna be called a tag. And over the wire, when we transfer this, uh, when we transfer this message over the wire, Unlike JSON, which use, you know, in every message is going to say something like, you know, name and then the value is Ray, right? You, you repeat this over and over again. That's what's taking up a lot of the bandwidth. In gRPC, in put a buffer, uh, we actually just use the, new, the byte value of this tag. So, you know, any tag that's between zero and 15, that will just take one byte. And uh, that's why for the most commonly used uh, fields, you wanna give it a tag that has a lower value, so it uses less bandwidth. And everything's strongly typed. There are many different uh, built-in types, so I can do something like int32 for the age. I can give it a tag as well. And uh, we can do something even more, like a list of things, right? So for example, I can do a repeated string, and I can code this hobbies and give it a name. It is pretty interesting to me that they don't use the, you know, the, the brackets or the, um, the, the square brackets for an array, but repeated string literally will get translated into an array uh, when you generate the, the code. You can also do like a bag or a map, right? So this is a key value map, and like Java, you can strongly type the key and strongly type the value. And I'm gonna call this one a bag of tricks, there we go. And uh, live coding is definitely not my bag of tricks here. What's even more is that you can do enumerations. Now this is cool. Uh, so rather than, so sometimes you may have uh, conditions like approved, not approved, right? Rather than sending zero and ones for it or true and false, you can be very explicit about what you mean. So you can create an enum, enum. And very similar concept in Java as well. And with enum, I can say something like a sentiment. How do you feel right now, okay? Uh, I'm feeling okay, 
right now. So I'm gonna say happy is equal to zero. Uh, you could be very sleepy right now, just like me as well. So I'm gonna say sleepy equals to one. Um, at the end of this talk, hopefully this is not gonna happen, but you could be very angry at me. So I'm gonna say angry is equal to two, all right? Uh, or excited, uh, whatever. Hopefully that's the outcome. I can set out to three. Okay, so once you have defined the enum, then I can use it just like any other type. So I can say sentiment is called sentiment and give it a tag. Now, you can also nest these different structures as well. So if I define another message, I can use it as a type here, right? And I can nest them um, just, we can go for basically forever to construct your data structure. Uh, so that's the request, and now we can go ahead and make it the response. So I can say, uh, hello, response, and I'm gonna get, do something like greeting is equal to one, okay? So now I have the request and the response. Now I can actually go ahead and define an RPC service with gRPC. And the keyword here that you can use, if you can see it, is called service, and I can say something like uh, greeting service, okay? And within this service, we can then define the actual operations. You can define multiple operations if you want to, and I'm just gonna do one, which is gonna be a greet, and I'm gonna say the hello request, and that goes inside here, hello request. That's the, the in input parameter. And then I can return the output like hello response. Oh, and um, English, I gotta do returns, there we go. All right, so that's it, that's all I need to do to define what we call a unary request or unary operation. Unary just means that uh, it's just one input and one output and um, you can code this synchronously if you want uh, and potentially asynchronously if you want. However, if you want to make this into say a streaming operation, for example, if you say hello to me and uh, you wanna listen to me saying hello, 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 hello back continuously in a stream, you don't wanna do that, but if you do, uh, all you need to do is to add the string keyword. And now, just by defining that single keyword, this service will become a streaming service, and this is a server-side streaming service. What that means is the server can string multiple responses to you over a single connection. If, for example, you want to continuously send data to the server, like collecting metrics, for example, or if you have an IoT device, you wanna continuously send the latest metric over to the server, then that's what we call uh, client-side streaming. Then you can add the stream keyword to the input, and that become a client-side streaming operation. If you need to do two-way conversation, two-way streaming, then you add stream to both sides, and that's it, okay? We're gonna take a look at how we can use bidirectional streaming in a second, but I'm gonna keep it uh, pretty simple for now to just do a unary request uh, in Java, okay? Once you have defined the IDL, once you have done this, then you have to run some kind of utility to generate the code, okay? And usually the, the, the generator is called the Proto C compiler. And here's the thing, for different languages, you, you can pretty much use the same Proto C compiler, but you have to download the right versions for the right platform. So because the binary is compiled to either run on OS X or on Windows or Linux or whatever. Um, so you can either download this yourself and redo this every single time, or uh, for example in Java, we can simply go ahead and use a plugin, okay? And what that means is that every time I'm going to build this Java application, it would automatically generate all the code for me uh, every, every single time I do this, so that whenever I change the IDL, it will also generate the right code. And so for that, I can simply go to my uh, GitHub repo here. So gRPC Java on GitHub, I'm gonna do a search. And there we go. Uh, this is called uh, Google Driven Development. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so once you find what you want, <laughs> you copy and paste, yeah. Copy and paste driven development right here. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Okay. Wow. Go away. That's uh, Guillaume, Guillaume Laforge. I don't know if anyone knows about Groovy, but uh, he's, uh, he's a Groovy um, maintainer and uh, in the committer. Uh, and he's actually part of our teams. All right, here we go. Okay, so I got a dependency here, and the next thing I need to do is to uh, generate. So I don't know if anyone here use Maven. Anyone use Maven? 
Woohoo! Maven, Gradle, Gradle. Oh, quite a few. Wow. Yeah. So I, I don't have an opinion on both, but just like you know, here's Gradle, and that's Maven. Just you know, Gradle is a little bit more compact, isn't it? So here's Maven, and that's Gradle. So you can do this compilation uh, automatically in both cases. Yeah. Go ahead. And then that was Brett, who's actually teaching the TensorFlow thing right now. Okay, so oh, let me undo, undo, undo. There we go. So that's dependencies, and I need to wrap this around dependency block. Okay, here we go. Dependency, um, here we go. And then I'm gonna paste in the build like that, and that should be it, I think. I think. All right. So. If I go back to my server here, I'm gonna do a Maven clean, just so there's no, no cheating here, okay? Remember, I just wrote the IDL, and uh, if I do a package, that's going to trigger this uh, plugin to, to run, and it's going to download, this actually downloads the right um, proto compiler for you, and the, the right generator for you, um, because it actually figures out which operating system you're running, and it's going to run the, the utility for you behind the scenes automatically, okay? So I'm gonna do an install instead. And if I go and look at the target directory, and again, this differs from language to language, but uh, if I go to see target and generated source, generated source right here, and I can see all the files that's been generated based on this, the, the single IDL, and that's my service right there, okay? So let's go ahead and implement this, right? So I have the code generated, we can actually now go implement this. Um, and the implementation for gRPC is very, very simple and straightforward. You just have to extend the base class that it generates. Now, in different language, you extend different things, but the idea is very similar. There's probably like an interface you implement or extend, and you just do whatever you want in that implementation. So I can go ahead and go and do like a public stack static class. Uh, I'm gonna call this a greeting service input that implements or extends the, uh, the base class right here, okay? And then I can go ahead and implement this uh, greet method. And here's the thing. At least for Java, when you are implementing the server, everything is going to be implemented with uh, a synchronicity in mind. So unlike what you would otherwise expect it to generate, uh, because at the beginning, this is what I thought it would be. It would be hello response, greet, hello, request, right? Like that would be a sensible thing to generate, but that's not the case. Why? Because if it's generated this way, this becomes a synchronous call, okay? So on the server side, literally everything here is going to be asynchronous, and that what, what that means is that you're taking the request, but you're also taking a stream observer, which is like a callback. So what that means is when you are done with your operation, you can code this callback to return the value to the client, okay, to the consumer. So for example, I can say something like, the greeting string is gonna be uh, hello uh, plus request.getName, okay? So that's one of the field I defined in the IDL. In fact, uh, many of the other things is defined there, and it's also mapped to the right types uh, for different languages as well. So like for example, sentiment here is actually an enum in Java. Okay. Uh, the two string is also implemented, so uh, you can actually do something like this. I can easily print out the entire payload. So I can do uh, like system print uh, request. Okay, okay, can do like that. For me to build a response in this specific case in Java, uh, we can create a response by using a builder. Okay, it's using builder pattern uh, extensively in gRPC, at least for Java. So with the builder, I can say uh, a new builder. I'm going to set set the greeting uh, attribute into the ones I just created, and uh, I'm going to build this, okay? And I can code this a response. So that will be a response. Now have I received the request, I process it, and now I have the response. How do I return this response? How do I do that? I use the observer, I use the callback, right? So I have the response observer, oh, observer dot now, look here, this is pretty interesting. There are three things you can call. Unnext, uncompleted, uh, and uncompleted, and unarrow. Uh, this is actually uh, almost like a reactive interface. I don't know if anyone has done reactive programming already, or RxJava. 
uh, it's, it's very similar. Uh, basically, what this means is that when you're doing the callback, um, you are expected to be able to respond multiple things if it's a string. And when you're done sending data to the client, then you have to call uncomplete. You have to do this explicitly, okay? And of course, if, if, if you have an error, then you say an error, and that's going to be sent to the client. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and do a next uh, response, like that. And remember, you have to call uncompleted. If you don't, the client will hand there and wait for more data. Uh, so this is one of the things you have to watch out for. Okay, so I'm going to say uncompleted. And that's it. That's all I need to do to implement the service itself. Now, uh, and you got to go back to, uh, to, 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 hold on a second. I got to go back to this thing and see how do I do the rest. Hold on a second. No, I'm just kidding now. Uh, to implement the server, it's also very easy to do. I have the, I, I defined the implementation class in this case. Now I need to start the server that serves this service. And to do that, in, again, in Java, everything is using a builder, so I can use a server builder, uh, listen to a port, say 8080, and then I can add the service I just created, a new instance of that, so I'm going to do that, and build it, okay? And I can call this a server, and that's it. However, I have to start it, so I can say start server. So now it's going to be actually starting, initializing, and listening on port 880, uh, and I have to wait for it to quit. Um, otherwise, my main thread will quit, and my process will just die immediately. So in this case, server is running the background thread, so I have to wait for it. Uh, otherwise, my main process will just go away. Okay. And that should be it, Ho hopefully, I think. Yeah. So if I do, if I say something here, uh, server started. There you go. Hopefully, I should be able to see it. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to do uh, exec Java. So it's compiling. Oh, there we go. Server started. Now I'm listening to uh, the the server on the port 8080, and this is a gRPC server, and it's listening uh, with the HTTP2. Okay. So far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Easy. It's too easy. <laughs> And then I can go ahead and, and implement the client, okay? And the client, again, is, uh, there's not so many lines of code at all, but there's a few things I want to point out. This is a very, very important concept. First of all, for me to open the connection to this gRPC server, I don't have to deal with the underlying TCP connections at all. Or I don't, I don't even need to deal with the HTTP2 connection. All of those things can be abstracted away for me. Uh, in the, the, the SDK, what you deal with is what we call a managed channel, okay? A channel is really just an abstraction of all of these underlying connection details behind the scenes that you don't really have to worry about. So with a channel, I can, at first I have to open up the channel, and to open it up, I need to know the server and the port, okay? And how do I create a new channel? I can use a builder. So there's a channel builder. I can say, go ahead and connect to my local host, and on port 8080, now, because I'm on this development machine, I don't have SSL set up or anything, so I'm just going to be doing this over plain text, okay? This is going to be a plain text connection over HTTP2, okay? And that's it. I'm going to build this channel, and now this single thing will be responsible to open the channel for me and connect to my server. Once you have the channel, what you can do then is to create a stop, right? If you, are, if you have done anything like a DCOM or SOAP or... Uh, RMI, right, there's always this stub interface you can uh, cr create that has the, the actual communication implementation behind the scenes. So I can go ahead and create a stub. And the stub will be initialized this way. I can say greeting service gRPC and new stub. Okay. Now, if you look closely here, there are actually three different types of stubs I can create. Now, on the server side, everything was created with uh, synchronously in mind. It is up to the client to decide whether the client wants to call this synchronously or asynchronously. So you can actually make a blocking stop. And then with that, you have this familiar response request interface. If you're dealing with Java, you can also create the future stop so you can deal with Java features. Now, uh, for this one, we're just going to deal with uh, the blocking stop, which is really easy. And that's going to take in the channel because it needs to know how to connect to it. OK, just like that. Uh, and I can assign this to a variable. I'm going to call this stop. Okay. With the stop, I can just make the call. 
So I can go ahead and code the request. Well, there you go. So I can code greet. And then I can build my request with a builder if I want to. New builder. And I'm going to set my name to Ray. Uh, set my age to 18, of course. And here we go. Okay? And that's, that's how I can make the uh, service call. Oh, oh, wow, what was that? That's my vi command going out of whack. Okay. And then I can go ahead and uh, get my response back. And um, I can just go ahead and print it out. I'll print line and print line the response. And after all of these, I want to shut down gracefully so I can go ahead and shut down the channel. I'm going to say channel shutdown now. Okay? And that's it. That's all I need to do to make one single request. And as you can see here, everything is type safe. Uh, I'm mostly using auto completion here to generate this code for me. Um, and let's see if it works. How many people think this is going to work? One person. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to have more demos so you all have other chances to vote, okay? Now, there you go. So you can see that, um, was it too fast? So here's the response that I got uh, from the server, and that's really easy. And here's the, uh, what the server was able to output, right, on the server side. And I can make another call if I want to. There you go, just another one. Now with gRPC, there are a few things that, uh, that's really, really nice. Well, well, first of all, with microservices, what you, need to need, what you need to be able to deal with is load balancing, right, and service discovery. So within the channel, what you can do is that you can set a, um, you can provide your own name resolver. What the name resolver needs to do is to give it a logical name, resolve it into the actual endpoints that you have. So if the hello service has 10 instances, this needs to be responsible to be able to resolve to those 10 IP addresses. And then you can specify a load balancing uh, strategy by specifying a load balancer factory. So you can do uh, round robin load balancing if you want to. Uh, there's a few other things, though, that's really neat. One is what we call metadata propagation. Okay? So if you, are, you have like a, a user ID, you need to propagate through all of the calls. You can propagate it um, through not just within the process, but also across server, server boundaries. So given the metadata, you can propagate it to every single call and also the subsequent call behind the scenes. Um, and another thing that's pretty important, at least you know, in, in some cases, where, you know, like on a mobile device, you don't want to wait forever for the response. So in some cases, you want to set a deadline or a TTL, right? Maybe you want to wait 500 milliseconds. That's, the, that's what you can tolerate on the user interface. So with gRPC, you can actually set deadlines if you want to. So with this stop, I can go ahead and uh, say with deadline, right? So I can actually say that, okay, with, I'm going to generate a new proxy for this. Every time I make an operation, the deadline is going to be, say, 500. And I can say the time, time, unit, time unit is uh, 500 milliseconds, okay? Something like that. Did I not get it right? With deadline, let me, let me try that again. Oh, yeah, okay, I gotcha. Hold on a second. <laughs> Java, there we go. With deadline here, and I can say deadline after, and then 500, yeah, there we go. And then time unit is a milliseconds, okay. Right, so, so now I can assign this to my stub again, and now this proxy will wait only 500 seconds for my response to come back. If it doesn't come back in 500 seconds, it's going to give you an exception called deadline exceeded exception, and now you know how to handle it on the server side, on the client side. What is even cooler is that the deadline is propagating. Okay? So in a microservices world, if you are making one call from the consumer, right, this other service probably proxies other services. So all of a sudden you're nesting multiple calls together. And the deadline can be propagated from the very top level call all the way to the bottom. So if the very first call takes about 200 milliseconds, the subsequent calls can only take 300 milliseconds, right? So this is actually enforced throughout the entire call stack. And if you need to cancel the top-level call, the cancellation can also be propagated all the way to the other services as well. And that is really nice to have, okay? So far so good? Easy? All right. So now I'm going to do something a little bit more interesting, which is to deal with, say, a, a, a bidirectional streaming case, okay? This is unirate, this is just a one-off request. But what if I need to um, do like bidirectional streaming? And I think one of the easiest ways to demonstrate it is by building a chat application. Now, 
I can also build a chat application in about five minutes with Firebase, <laughs> but, uh, but this is more fun with gRPC. <laughs> okay, so what do I do first if I wanna build a chat? Well, first of all, I define a profile, right? And I can define the message, uh, both the input and the response. Now again, here you can see I'm using the string keyword, so I'm doing, gonna be doing bidirectional string right here. And then I can go ahead and implement this interface as well. So I'm gonna go and go to the code. And we have to implement the server. So this is what the server is going to do. It's going to listen to a stream of data that's coming in from the client, and then do some kind of processing and then push the data out in a streaming fashion back to the client and to all of the clients, right? So every time a client connects to me, it's going to open, it's going to make this call to chat a method, and it's going to give me this response observer. And with this reference of this observer, I can then send data to that specific instance of the consumer or that instance of the client. So what I do first is to keep track of all of the connections that's open to me to this specific server, and that's why I'm going to do this first, right? Just adding this reference to a list of connected client. And then what I need to do is to listen to the incoming requests. Now, the, 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 the API is a little bit reversed. If you're a customer with Java, again, you would think that the request is going to come in through the parameters of the method. But because this is a streaming call, what that means is the, re the streaming request is coming in via a callback method. And in order for the server to know what to call back, you have to give it back a stream observer in implementation. So what I need to do here is I can return a new stream observer, and now I need to implement these three different methods. And these methods will be called when something is being sent from the client to me, okay? So this unnext callback will be called when the client sends me a message. And when that happens, what do I need to do? Well, maybe I need to go to iterate through my, all of my connected clients, and I'm gonna resend this message to everyone else. Okay, so what I can do is I can do something like, uh, I'm gonna copy and paste this thing right here. Oh, maybe that's too much. No, yeah, definitely too much. So I'm gonna just copy this part, yep. Oh, wow, my IntelliJ. Is, uh, yeah, there we go, observer, and um, string observers right here, okay? And for every one of these clients that's connected to me, I'm going to call the onX on the client. And for this, I need to return a message. I'm going to send a message from the server to the client, and that will look something like this. So chat message from the server, uh, and how do I create a new message? With a builder, there you go. And I can set the message to be the one that just came in, which is called chat message right here. And then I can go ahead and build it, okay? And that's it, that's all I need to do to kind of get the streaming data in and then send the data back, okay? Uh, if there's an error that happened, I'll just do what every developer do, which is uh, do nothing, here we go. <laughs> or, or maybe a print stack trace if you're a Java developer. <laughs> And then uncompleted, just nothing, not, oh, oh, there's one thing I do need to do. I need to remove the reference that, uh, I need to remove this connection from my references. Other one, I'm gonna be sending data to dead uh, clients, which I don't wanna do. So uh, that's exactly what I'm going to do, okay. So yeah, it's not just do nothing. You actually have to do something. Okay, here we go. So that's the server, that's it. I, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to return null. Uh, no, don't return null, because I need to remove that. And that's my server. Yeah, so far so good. You think this will work? Yeah, thank you, yeah. Building confidence here. I lose confidence as the, the, the talk goes um, forward, so we will see. All right, so nothing, there's no error. The server is running, it's running a daemon, it's listening to port 9090. Why is it listening to port 9090? Because I said so right here, okay? So that's how I'm starting the server. Three lines of code. Okay, now let's go ahead and implement the client. Uh, for the client, I'm gonna be using JavaFX, okay? And it looks like this, basically uh, like the, that's the chat window on the top, and I can say my name, and I can say hello, and then if I click on send, uh, it should appear, it should appear uh, in the text box on the top, okay? But it's not doing it because I haven't implemented it yet, okay? So let me delete that, I'm gonna do that right now. It's a pretty good, uh, nice use case of gRPC, and you can see how bidirectional streaming works nicely, okay? 
So how do I make the call? So first I create the channel, you have seen that already, and then I create a stop. And this time the stop is actually an instinct stop. This stop actually just uses callbacks. And I can make a call to this, I can call uh, chat service.greet, oh sorry, not sorry, uh, chat. And it expects a stream observer, okay? And what is this one? Which one? They're, they're all called stream observers, which kind of messes with my mind sometimes. So this one is an input. So this stream observer is a callback that the client wants to listen to when the server sends the data to the client, okay? So whenever the server sends me something, it's going to invoke this uh, callback on next. And when this happens, I'm, I can go ahead and add my message to the list. Uh, so that it can appear. So what I can do is I can do a chat message from server, I'm going to get the message, get it from, uh, and plus uh, a calling here, and uh, get message, get the message, and get the message, okay? Yeah, and because it's JavaFX, if you're, you know, if you're uh, dealing with Android, you will know that things that needs to run in the UI is a UI thread, and things that runs in the, you know, that makes a connection runs in the background thread, right? So for this one, I need to say uh, platform dot run later, okay? So that I can run this in the right thread, and do that, okay? If there's an error, again, I'm gonna do nothing. Uh, and if it's completed, uh, I do nothing as well, okay? And I think that's it. That's all I need to make the call. That's all I need to do to listen for the data being streamed to the client. Now, here's the, here's the tricky question. How do I send the data to the server? How do I do that? It's not, we, we don't do this within the, the method parameter, right? What we do is we get a reference to the server's callback observer. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna call this a reference, a uh, you know, chat uh, messages to server, okay? And from this callback, what I can do is then I can say messages to server on next. And every time I call on next, it's going to send something to the server, okay? And for me to implement it, I have to listen to the click event. I can set the, uh, listen to this event, which when uh, somebody click on the button, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to use our reference, uh, messages to server, on next, right? I'm going to create a new chat message here with the builder, yeah? You see the pattern here, from the, uh, the name, so that's the text box number one, and I need to set the message to uh, text box number two, get text, and I can build this, okay. And that's it, so every time I click on the message, I'm going to string the data to the server, and again, this is all going to, over the same string, uh, over the same connection. Wait, hold on a second. There's a compilation error. <laughs> do, you, do you spot the error somewhere? I think, uh, I think I know, there it is, yeah, there we go, okay. Uh, semicolon, all right. This is why I left Java. Yeah, they tell me when something's about to go wrong. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna see a show of a hand again. Uh, how many people think this will work? Wow, wow, even less people. That is so sad. <laughs> That's okay, but uh, we'll find out soon because uh, the last time I demonstrated, it, it actually didn't work. So, <laughs> oh, hold on a second. I need, I need to do one thing. Wait, wait, wait. Let me make sure this. Yeah, that's installed. That's fine. Yeah, and uh, I'm gonna do a clean. Is, uh, clean? No. Yeah, clean. Why not? Hold on a second. Almost done. Almost done. Oh, yeah, it's running. Good. And uh, let's do the run. Sometimes I don't know why I do this. It's just very uh, exciting, and um, it's the adrenaline to see if this actually works. So, <laughs> so hello, so here we go. Hello, DevFest DC, make it or break it, here we go. All right, not bad, not bad. It actually works on one, one machine, one machine. Yeah, yeah, that's not, that's not good enough, hold on. <laughs> so what I wanna do is that I wanna start uh, multiple clients here. I'm gonna do two, and uh, is, uh, is Cheetah here, Cheetah? No, I don't see him. So I'm gonna say Cheetah, like, Ray, good job. That's, uh, that's what I hope that he would say to me. <laughs> I'm gonna say, say that, and there we go. Now you can actually see both. Yeah, very good. Oh, Cheetah is right there, awesome. <laughs> I get to keep my job. There we go. There we go, so it still works, yeah. <laughs> so this is bi-directional streaming with gRPC. As you can see, it's pretty simple to use. It's really, it's very different from uh, what you may have been using before. 
and it's all built on some of the standard technology uh, that's out there today. Uh, with that, I just want to leave you with uh, a few other things. Uh, it is open source. It is fully open source. So we are always looking for contributors and people from the community and uh, your feedback as well. So please go to grpc.io, and um, there's a community page, actually. So let me take photo first. Photo first. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> photo first, yeah. With that, everybody only takes that, yeah. But uh, <laughs> let, me, let me go to grpc.io. Hold on a second. Yeah. And uh, community, yeah. And yeah, there we go, so community. So here we have a mailing list, we have Gitter channel for chat, we have Twitter, uh, and, um, and there's a whole bunch of Java ecosystem that you can look into. So please, please go check it out and participate. And if you're really into the whole microservices uh, development, uh, there are two things you need to watch out for, right? I mean, in addition to service discovery, you wanna be able to trace your calls when, you're, when you are making multiple requests across multiple layers with multiple services, you maybe want to keep track of what the hell is happening behind the scenes. So you have a single trace ID. And for that, you can use um, a Zipkin. There is a really nice uh, open source project called Zipkin that helps you with distributed tracing. And uh, there's actually a gRPC Zipkin example out there somewhere you can actually use. Uh, and the other thing is, um, there's one more, one more. Uh, monitoring of your system. So if you need to monitor your metrics, uh, go ahead and you can use, uh, say, Prometheus. Right, so you can see uh, Java gRPC Prometheus. That's also another very nice framework to use. So let me see, and that's it, yeah. So give it a try, and uh, let me know how you like it. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions, we have time for questions, I don't know. One question, if there is any question. If not, I will be outside. Yeah, we're good, all right, thank you.